Welcome to another episode of DMTV, World After Coronavirus. Our previous guests uh, included Noam Chomsky, Slavo Žižek, uh, Brian Eno, Yanis Varoufakis, Eja Temel Kuran, Saskia Sassen. The list is very long, uh, and this program is also already taking place for more than two weeks, uh, and it will take place as long as needed. Uh, tonight, I'm very happy and grateful that uh, we have a special guest from New York, United States, as tonight's day, not only this show, but also the next show with Astra Taylor and David Adler is focused on one of the new epicenters of the global pandemics, uh, namely United States. Um, our guest tonight is Jeremy Scahill, a uh, famous uh, investigative journalist from the United States, uh, one of the founding uh, editors of Intercept, uh, author of several books, uh, among them Blackwater and uh, Dirty Wars. Uh, he has been reporting uh, from various places from the world, including Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, and former Yugoslavia. Uh, Jeremy, hello. Nice to see you again. You too, Sretko. I wish it was under better circumstances. I wish so. Yeah, when I imagine and remember last summer when we met last time, that was completely different. Uh, but, well, we are here, so let's discuss, let's use this hour to discuss and also to show some ways out. Uh, could you perhaps for the beginning tell us, I mean, I know where you are, you are in New York. Could you describe us what, what, what does it look like these days in New York? Well, you know, I, li I live in a, uh, a part of New York called Sunset Park, which is one of the largest immigrant communities in the city. Um, and it is, I live adjacent to uh, Brooklyn Chinatown. And, you know, this is an area that already public health statistics show is being hit very, very hard. And, you know, one of the most striking aspects to the coronavirus crisis is the kind of banality of the terror that it is reaping on so many particularly vulnerable communities. I live right in front of a bus stop that is used by uh, a lot of workers to, uh, to travel to and from uh, their places of employment. And what you've seen in New York is that people who have means, people who are wealthier, people who are not working so-called blue collar jobs or working at grocery stores, um, they're able to stay in place and shelter and they have access to paying exorbitant prices for masks. And what we've seen, uh, particularly in the past two weeks as, it, as the crisis has intensified and as the death toll has skyrocketed, we're almost at, at the same number of deaths that occurred on 9-11 in, in New York City. In fact, we're probably going to pass it today. But what, we, what you're seeing is Subways and buses continue to be packed with non-white, for the most part, workers. And, and so in, in my neighborhood, uh, you see buses that still have people on board, that still have people not wearing masks, that still have people who are being forced to work, um, many of them for employers that are not taking care of workers' rights. Um, workers at Amazon are striking, workers at Instacart, the delivery service are uh, striking. When you go into grocery stores now, the local or family owned ones often are providing masks and gloves to their workers and the big huge chains, including Amazon, owned by the richest human being in the world, uh, has some atrocious practices. In fact, Srechko, uh, in Staten Island, which is the borough closest to, to Brooklyn here, you had a young uh, warehouse worker named Christian Smalls, who is an African-American father of three. And he was an assistant manager at his warehouse. And he started organizing because he was concerned that the company was not taking uh, the outbreak of COVID-19 at his workplace seriously. Um, and they forced him into a quarantine uh, and did not quarantine other workers on the same grounds that they quarantined him because he started agitating and organizing. And then he successfully organized a walkout of the workers at the JFK 8 warehouse. And he was then fired by Amazon. And what leaked in recent days was notes from a meeting that Jeff Bezos himself, the richest human being on planet Earth, attended, where their high-powered lawyers, including one who is a major fundraiser for Joe Biden, the leading corporate Democratic candidate, where they discussed how to smear this young African-American worker to try to make him the face that they would try to destroy of organized union activity 
among Amazon workers. So to me, and the reason I'm telling that story, to me, this encapsulates what has happened in this country in the midst of this pandemic, is that we have immediately reverted to an all out feudalist system, where if you are the richest, the most powerful, you are going to be taken care of. And if you are the poorest or the most vulnerable, you might get some crumbs off the tables of the Bezoses or the Bloombergs of the world. But let's be clear, they want you to die. They want you to work. And if you can't work, they want you to die. And that is the reality in this country right now. We have a psychopath, sociopath as president. We have a spineless opposition movement that can't even call itself opposition. And we have a dire crisis where 10 million people have applied for unemployment in the last two weeks, where more than 3 million people are going to be losing their health care because it is tied to their employment. And we have an opposition that refuses to fight tooth and nail for health care for all free on point of service. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeremy. Maybe I can just give you also my perspective from yeah. Europe, because I think for, for, for the US audience, uh, perhaps they cannot even imagine, uh, okay, the situation is not good in Europe, it depends on different countries, but I think they cannot even imagine that in some of these countries, I'm currently in Austria, I come from Croatia, which was part of socialist Yugoslavia, uh, we had a healthcare system, we still have a more or less functioning healthcare system, uh, which was free, which was public, which was universal for all the people, and all these governments, uh, most of them, introduced measures on time, like I'm in self-isolation already for 20 days. Uh, this country here in Vienna introduced uh, a banning of public events already two weeks ago. Uh, uh, you can see that uh, the governments are reacting differently. So when we from Europe look at the United States, uh, we are really horrified and we are, we are surprised. And it also brings me to, to something what uh, I, I, I guess you know, you remember when this Iranian minister one month ago or something, uh, mentioned that uh, coronavirus is a democratic virus uh, in the sense that it's not, it, it's not discriminating. It, it hits the rich, it hits the political leaders and also the, uh, the, the poor. And I think this is ideology at its purest because what you, can, what you just described and what I could also tell here in Vienna, I mean, the situation is luckily not so bad, but the people you can see here on the streets, I mean, the city is more or less empty, nothing is working except supermarkets and pharmacies, but the people you can see who are working are the shop assistants, the delivery people, uh, the postmen, the, the waste collectors and so on. And you can obviously see that this is a class issue, that people uh, who were poor and who, the working class, they are the ones who are the most vulnerable ones. Uh, so uh, how do you see the situation in the United States uh, uh, developing further with this sociopath in, in, in power, who doesn't even want to put a mask on his hand. Yeah, I mean, let's let's back up and, and remember uh, that Donald Trump um, has put a premium on ignorance, and uh, and 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 you know, part of the the body politic of the United States that might be difficult for people to understand when they ask themselves, how is it possible that Donald Trump became president now? It's important to remember that Donald Trump lost the popular vote in the United States uh, by three million. You know, Hillary Clinton got three million more votes than Donald Trump. And by the way, I mean, Hillary Clinton is a totally corporate Democrat and is is a part of the problem. Um, but she is not Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump ran on a fascistic platform and he mobilized uh, a a large sector of society that generally do not vote, and that's racist, bigoted individuals. He mobilized them to vote akin to how Ronald Reagan got evangelical Christians to vote uh, in the 1980s, you know, a traditionally non-voting segment of the population. And Trump thrives on this notion uh, that we want our leaders to be dumber than we are. We want our leaders to be kind of fictional, cartoonish characters. Obama, who was arguably one of the smartest individuals to hold office, was absolutely despised by large sectors of Trump's base, not because he was a Kenyan Muslim socialist, because he was smarter than they were, and he happened to be black. And, and that's a reality in this country. But you know, cutting to the, to the heart of what you just asked, I grew up in a, in a mid-sized American city called Milwaukee. Both of my parents are nurses. And in that city, which is one of the most segregated cities in the United States, the population is 26% African-American. 
And yet more than 80% of the coronavirus deaths in that city are African-Americans. This uh, virus doesn't discriminate in terms of who it uh, infects, but our system discriminates against people who are sick. And I'm sorry, when Donald Trump or Joe Biden say we need coronavirus treatment to be free, and that, that is the policy that's being pursued right now, that doesn't include if you get a heart attack or if you have cancer or if you have some other debilitating illness. Let's not even talk about mental health care, which we don't have any of in this country that's, that's covered by insurance for the most part. But basically, capitalism is a death sentence right now that is being meted out against the poorest, the most vulnerable, and particularly against non-white populations in the United States. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, the voters of, of Donald Trump. What, what I'm wondering, and maybe you can help us to understand it better, is uh, because the recent polls are showing that actually Trump is rising for various reasons. Maybe you can also explain the reasons. But what I'm wondering at is, uh, do you think that these voters who voted for Trump, uh, uh, when the new US elections come, will they vote for him again? You know, what if their fathers, grandmothers, children die because Trump reacted in the way he reacted to the coronavirus crisis? You know, yeah. what do you think this will have? What kind of effects? on the upcoming US elections. I mean, for, first of all, just to, to unpack a little bit what, what you, you said and, and to clarify what I'm, what I'm saying, I am not saying that everyone who voted for Donald Trump is an ignorant backwards you know, asshole. Uh, they, in fact, there were, there were a uh, minority, but it was significant enough to talk about a uh, number of voters who were Obama voters who then voted for Donald Trump. You had people that were, uh, you know, supportive of Democratic candidates who then voted for uh, Donald Trump. Trump appealed to, uh, particularly to a lot of white women in the suburbs. Fifty-three percent of white women in this country voted for Donald Trump. Um, he also appealed to people who were hurt by Democratic uh, Party policies on trade, uh, like NAFTA or GATT. Uh, you know, World Trade Organization dictates. And, and there was this perception that Trump was going to shake up the system. So it's not just that you had racist ignoramuses supporting Donald Trump. I think that uh, the point I was making was that he mobilized people that normally wouldn't participate in the democratic process to, to, to vote. Um, now, as for the current situation, what we've seen is um, an uptick in support for how Trump has handled coronavirus. And you know, America is, is, a, is a peculiar country in a lot of ways. And the kind of form of American exceptionalism that is embraced here dictates that you have to rally around the commander in chief at a time of crisis. And we saw that with George Bush during 9-11. You know, we've seen it throughout US history. So part of this, you, know, you, you, you shouldn't read too deeply into it, has to do with kind of the brainwashing of Americans to uh, be called to rally around the flag. And that often means checking your conscience at the door. But look, here's the reality as I see it. If Joe Biden is the Democratic nominee for president, he, is, uh, he has a 40-year track record of very bad policies. He has been accused of inappropriate conduct uh, by eight women, one of whom says that, she, uh, that he raped her. Uh, and he is often not aware of what room he's in. He cannot speak clearly unless he has notes in front of him or he's reading off of a teleprompter. He has repeatedly lied about his role in the civil rights movement. He was, until very recently, telling a fallacious tale about how he had been arrested in apartheid South Africa. His son, Hunter Biden, definitely there are questions about nepotistic exploitation that led to him getting a job working for a Ukrainian oil interest, Burisma. Donald Trump is going to fillet Joe Biden if they actually have a debate. And the way I, I would put it is not, is Donald Trump going to win? It's, is Joe Biden going to do the unthinkable, pull off the impossible, which is allowing Donald Trump to win another election? It's almost as though the Democratic Party wants Donald Trump to continue on for four more years. And you know, Joe Biden's ascent to being the front runner is akin to a coalition uh, in terms of, not in terms of voters, but in terms of powerful institutions of the worst aspects of the Democratic Party running a coalition government. You know, it's, it's as though it's a parliamentary slate, to put it in European terms, filled with the worst people from the center, center left sort of parties and ignoring and demonizing the candidates in the race who actually want real change. You know, it's, it's, it's the ridicule reserved for supporters of Bernie Sanders or at times for Elizabeth Warren. 
is much more passionate than uh, the war on Donald Trump in some quarters. It's like, I really wanna know if some liberals hate Bernie Sanders more than they hate Donald Trump. And that may not make sense for people in Europe, like, but we're the only country that I know of in the world that has had large demonstrations against healthcare. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear where, where that happened, but, but, but there is one similarity with Europe, I would say. You know, if you remember the uh, UK elections uh, 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 in England, you know, with That's Corbyn. That's not Europe anymore, Srechko. Yeah, but you can see that it's precisely that the establishment actually hates the, even the social democrats, you know, I think Corbyn's program compared to what is needed today, it sounds even moderate, you know, even if free broadband internet would be something we need, even if you can see that Boris Johnson is now nationalizing the railways and so on, but you, can, you could have seen in that elections, but also in other elections all across Europe, that the establishment hates the social democrats and the left even more than they hate the populist and the autocrat leaders. Uh, but what I want to ask you is, so you mentioned Bernie Sanders, uh, what are the chances of Bernie Sanders now? You know, is Donald Trump going to postpone the elections? Are the elections going to happen if this crisis continues? Is the Democratic Party going to realize that Medicare for all is the only solution for saving lives and that Bernie Sanders is the only candidate uh, who can put it forward? Or are the chances toward zero? I mean, I, I, th I think that there are there is a slim chance that uh, somehow Bernie Sanders ends up being the Democratic nominee. It's not impossible. Um, you know, I, I look, I, I think there are two uh, roads we could go down here. One I find less interesting than the other. One road would be look at the at some of the mistakes and some of them are significant that Bernie Sanders made in his uh, campaign. Um, and, and that's a lot of what big media outlets want to talk about in this country. And I think it's worth talking about. But the discussion is on that is being had at the expense of the bigger picture, which is what are the consequences of not running someone like Bernie Sanders as the Democratic candidate? And to simply reduce it down to, well, Joe Biden beat him in South Carolina, and then he beat him on Super Tuesday. Uh, first of all, it ignores the fact that Bernie Sanders won the state of California. One of 10 Americans live in California. Um, but let's, let's take that on the surface and say Joe Biden has been winning these primaries. What gets ignored is the role of the institutional elites within the Democratic Party, the role behind the scenes of Barack Obama in trying to force some of those other can corporate candidates to drop out. And then um, what, uh, what role large corporate media outlets played. If you watched even the liberal, the so-called liberal network in the United States, MSNBC, it was basically a one note propaganda network trying to destroy Bernie Sanders, digging up as much dirt on him, and there isn't much dirt to be dug, but hurling it any, every which way. Michael Bloomberg, one of the wealthiest people in the world, his entire intervention in the Democratic primary was to spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, mostly in ads that were aimed at undermining Bernie Sanders. So yes, Joe Biden has won a number of primaries. He's 300 delegates in our system up right now. That's a pretty sizable lead, but around 50% of Americans haven't had a chance to vote yet in terms of the Democratic primaries in their primaries. And so what you're seeing is Joe Biden taking the posi same position as Republican lawmakers across the country in trying to push forward with in-person voting. You know, I'm from the state of Wisconsin. Right now, as you and I are talking, the Democrat who is the governor of that state is trying to convince the Republicans who control the legislature to delay in-person voting in that state. Bernie Sanders has supported a delay. He's called for it for public health reasons. Joe Biden continued throughout the week to push the idea that there were any safe circumstances under which people could go out and vote in person. So why is it that the most powerful Republicans and the presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party are both pursuing what is going to be a reckless and dangerous disenfranchisement of voters that could kill people? And, and that's, that's just how we have to put it. Joe Biden encouraged people to go out and vote in the states of Florida and Illinois Poll workers have gotten sick as a result of having in-person voting. Voters have gotten sick as a result of in-person voting. You know, Joe Biden gets asked, does Donald Trump have blood on his hands? And he says, I wouldn't go that far. If there is a leader in the world right now who has blood on his hands, 
for how they have failed to respond to this crisis, it's Donald John Trump. Yeah, I mean, well, from what you say, I know that uh, maybe in the US, this kind of political incorrectness I will use now is not so often. But what you describe, it, uh, it just brings me to the following conclusion, you know, that the choice between Donald Trump and Joe Biden is like a choice between e Ebola and SARS, you know, it's it's like, I mean, maybe it's over, uh, you know, maybe I'm exaggerated, uh, but, you know, it looks like that from our perspective, the only candidate would be someone who would push saving human lives in this situation. Well, I, I mean, I, just just to I, I know that that that's the the, the perception. I mean, I, I I think that there is value to uh, the mentality, given that we have a corporate controlled duopoly in this country, where uh, because of the way the corporations are involved with our electoral process, using dark money, uh, because the the Democratic and Republican Party. Uh, do everything in their power to prevent third parties from being in debates or getting on the ballot. Um, when it boils down to a choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, or potentially a choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, for some of the most vulnerable people in this country, uh, and when you look at our, uh, our judges who are lifetime appointments on the Supreme Court, you can make a reasonable case that it is harm reduction, that you are trying to uh, choose the least damaging option if you're given only two choices in an effort to try to stop Trump from further consolidating his fascism. Now, I say that, but I also believe that if people want to vote third party and they want to vote their conscience, they should not be ridiculed for doing that. You know, and, and, and the problem is not people who support the minuscule percentage of, of votes that the Green Party gets. The problem is people that don't bother to demand that this system be fundamentally dismantled that creates a reality that we only have a choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. On this specific issue, though, as an example, Srechko, Joe Biden's top advisor, uh, he's not scientific, but public health and policy, is a guy named Ron Klain, who is a longtime Democratic uh, Party lawyer. He was the lawyer for Al Gore during the Gore versus Bush. And he led the Obama-Biden uh, response to the Ebola crisis. Ron Klain is a legitimate expert on, on public policy at a time of, of pandemic. When you compare that to Jared Kushner or to Mike Pence, who literally believes that Adam and Eve were, were alive at the time of the dinosaurs, you know, running around, um, there is no comparison. So, you know, I, I get that. But if Hillary Clinton had won the election, um, I think we would have had a lot of war. I think there would have been ways in which it, we, it, we would have been worse off globally. But on a public health perspective, on a judicial perspective, there's no comparison between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And I say this as a militant opponent of the policy of many of the policies that Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden stand for. But look, we've, we, we have fascism that's being consolidated in this country right now. And it isn't people who look like me that are going to pay the highest price. You know, it's, it's going to be women. It's going to be immigrants. It's going to be people of color. So, you know, we're all fighting like hell to try to stop the Democrats from once again handing the White House to a dangerous individual. But if the Sanders campaign implodes, and, and let's just be clear, Sanders is not going to run as a third party candidate. He is just not, it's just not going to happen. Um, and he wouldn't be able to get on the ballot in time unless he ran, you know, under an existing party framework. Um, so a lot of us on the left in this country are almost certainly going to be in a position where we're going to have to decide uh, whether to agree with the idea of voting for harm reduction uh, in an effort to get Trump out um, or uh, completely breaking with the Democratic Party and uh, taking the consequences of that and understanding what the consequences of it are. But it's not a simple matter in this country. You know, I mean, I've, I've talked with a lot of non-Democrats who are organizing third party. And I think generally speaking, um, people want Trump gone. And you know it sucks that we're in this position, and it is absolutely the fault of of uh, the Democratic Party leadership for for doing everything in its power to stomp out and kill the campaigns of true heroes of the people who want actual meaningful change. Um, but we're in a we're in a code red emergency here with with someone who you think Trump's three and a half years have been bad. You give this guy another four years, and fascism is going to be consolidated in Washington. Yeah, not, not only that, I mean, what worries me 
from the European perspective, uh, it's not just what is going to happen uh, with the coronavirus crisis in the United States, uh, but uh, also not just in Europe, because as you said, you, me, we are privileged people, you know, although I am in an apartment which is not mine, in a city which is not mine, I cannot return to my country and so on, I'm much more privileged than many other people in this country and in other countries, not to mention India, you know, coronavirus is spreading to the slums now. Nigeria, who have 500 ventilators for a country of I don't know how many million. Uh, but what worries me is the effects. You know, imagine a situation that the coronavirus pandemics is somehow contained, which it won't be by the current measures of Donald Trump, even if he's stealing masks, face masks from Germany, you know, in a modern uh, version of piracy, which was really like uh, amazing to see, uh, scandalous. Uh, but what we can expect, obviously, is that this will go on for months and for years and that the consequences beyond the, 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 the hundreds of thousands of people who will die now will be hundreds of thousands and millions of people who might die because of a deep recession and economy, economic crisis. So I want to pose you a question. You mentioned several times already 9-11. You know, during 9-11, what happened is that after 9-11, uh, you uh, uh, basically, Bush got rid of most of the civil liberties. You had this total surveillance, which was later revealed by Edward Snowden, Glenn Greenwald, also by Intercept and so on. Uh, uh, but what you have now, I think is also dangerous that instead of a war on terror, you have a war on virus. And it's very interesting to see yeah. that everyone is speaking in this kind of war discourse. Uh, where at yesterday's episode of this show with Brian Enoch, he mentioned that uh, he said, and I think it's, it's, it's what's going to happen, you know, he said, just remember what kind of measures were introduced after 9-11 and what measures stayed. Just look at the airport. Yeah. And then he said, just imagine what will stay after the war on virus. How will airports look like? I can tell you a perspective from Austria, which is not Hungary, you know, you see what's happening in Hungary. In Hungary, you have Viktor Orban uh, 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 dissolving the parliament, ruling on decree, uh, 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 journalists in prison and so on, basically a dictatorship inside of the European Union. But what you have in Austria, which is still a democratic country, is that you have geolocation tracking of people, uh, you know, a combination of the tech technology sector and the state, yeah. You can see what Palantir is doing with the NHS, with other countries and so on. So my big worry is that this might be even worse than 9-11. So how do you see if, yeah, how do you see this developing further if Donald Trump uses this as his 9-11? I mean, I've, I've been starting to call it COVID-1984 uh, because it's, you know, it, it, it the far right, and, and I include huge corporations as members of the far right, it doesn't matter how much philanthropy Jeff Bezos and Mike Bloomberg do, that's crumbs off of their table. That is, that is the, the amount of money that they owe the working people whose blood, sweat and tears created their empires uh, is, is so much greater in magnitude than any donation either of them could ever make of N95 masks or ventilators. They are part of an extreme right reality in the world that believes that workers and the poor, uh, that their lives matter less than the rich and the wealthy and the powerful. That it, this is corporate feudalism. It's as Martin Luther King talked about, it's socialism for the rich and it's rugged individualism for everyone else. And, and that's what we saw uh, a few days ago in the US Congress when not a single member of either party or either house of our Congress voted against the most consequential corporate bailout in the history of this country. Not a single one, not Bernie Sanders, not Elizabeth Warren. Why, why did that happen? It yeah, happened- How do you explain why, that? How do you explain Bernie, that? Because Donald Trump right now controls the White House. Our Supreme Court is now stacked with right-wing judges. The US Senate, which is a racist white supremacist relic of, of a previous era in the United States is controlled by one of the most vile human beings to ever serve as a lawmaker in the US, Mitch McConnell. And, and without boring everyone with the intricacies of how the US Congress works, it, it comes down to this, Trechko. The Republican party and some corporate Democrats essentially used poor, sick and working people in this country as hostages in an effort to free billions upon billions of dollars 
to give to corporations in return for very minimal aid. You're going to send a check for $1,200 to people who can't pay their rent, whose rent is more than that in the case of many people in New York City. So Bernie Sanders was contemplating voting against it. He had his sort of uh, star turn in the process when he threatened to put a hold on the legislation if the Republicans didn't back off of, of some of the most egregious things they tried to ram into the bill. But at the end of the day, Bernie Sanders uh, voted for it. And I believe that both he and Warren felt like, A, it could be political suicide for them. Okay, I'm not so interested in that. But B, then how much longer are people gonna have to wait for the crumbs even that are getting kicked off the rich people's table? So, you know, I'm against it, but I understand why Sanders and Warren in particular went along with it. But we had one member of Congress after 9-11, Barbara Lee, African-American lawmaker from the Bay Area in California, who voted against the forever war authorization, only one. And she got death threats. She had to have security because of what she did. She was right, 100% right. We had one US Senator, Russ Feingold of Wisconsin, who voted against the Patriot Act. He got death threats. He was right. We didn't have anybody. We didn't have anybody. And you know what they did in our people's house, in the House of Representatives? One Republican did the right thing and stood up, Thomas Massey, who's from the South, and I can't stand him at all, but he said, I demand a recorded vote. I wanna hear how all, uh, you know, 450 odd members of the House of Representatives, how you vote on this bill, the most consequential bill. And the Republican leadership and Democratic leadership conspired together to make sure that would not happen. So no member of the House of Representatives had to go on record saying whether they would have voted for or against it because they did a, a voice vote. That's anti-democratic. That defies the idea that you have uh, uh, a voice through elected representatives. And it was one Republican who was calling for that. No Democrats, not Bernie Sanders voting against it. I get why he didn't do it, but really we want this to go down in history with not a single voice of conscience. Shameful. Yeah, I don't know what to say, except that Europe is also not much better. You know, we don't have transparency when it comes to voting. There is nothing on record. I mean, actually our movement, DiEM25, uh, recently released the so-called EuroLeaks, which showed what the Eurogroup was doing during yeah. the crisis and in which way decisions are made by bodies which are not even constitutional they don't exist in front of law and they are doing decisions which have effects on millions of people uh, but jeremy i don't want to monopolize this uh, uh, show let's not be like the republicans uh, it's a democratic show and we're getting already questions from our audience from the live stream youtube so let me immediately go there and then we can continue the conversation uh, first question is uh, how probable, how probable it is that the coronavirus pandemics will insensitize US politics to do systemic changes? I mean, you mentioned already some things, but- oh, No, but it's a good, I mean, it's a good question. Look, I, right now, you, I mean, you know, a lot of people have been talking about Naomi Klein's work on the shock doctrine, and I think it's really important. And if people haven't read it, I think Naomi actually is trying to, uh, is, is working on ways to make it free for people to, uh, to download. Um, so, you, you know, you can look at her Twitter feed on, on that. But the, the reason I raise it is because one thing that corporations and particularly the right wing uh, in the U.S. in terms of organized uh, political forces that, that seek and win office, um, one thing that they have PhDs in is exploiting crises to alter society for the worse. We saw that on a micro level in New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, where you had rich people literally saying to the Wall Street Journal, if the demographics of this, and by the way, New Orleans is a historic black city, if the demographics of the city don't change, we're out of here, we're pulling our money out of here. The corporate bailout that just happened in the United States is gonna be one of the greatest redistributions of wealth in this country from the federal budget which is ultimately going to be on the backs of the taxpayers at the end of the day, transferring it to the private sector. Trump then issues a signing statement that nullifies almost completely the ability of Congress to oversee how that money is being doled out and what restrictions are gonna be placed on it. And yet you have this idea of means-tested aid for the, for the people. 
meaning that you have to like look at, well, how much does this person make and what would their tax returns look like just to give them $1,200, you know? So they're already way ahead of us. They're already restructuring our society. Uh, I live in an area with tons of small locally owned bodegas and dollar stores and my, you know, there's no corporate anything in my neighborhood. They're all shut. Even places that could be determined to be essential, like grocery stores, many of them have had to shut down because they only have a few employees. And if the employees get sick, what do they do? Or they can't afford to keep up their rent you know, because they can't get toilet paper in the United States. So no one's coming to buy toilet paper from you. The reason I bring that up is because we're, we are heading toward a world where we only have Amazon and Walmart, where we don't have locally owned businesses. You know, one thing that I've been doing uh, you know, for a while, but particularly uh, in the midst of this, is trying to get produce from farmers. You know, we have things in the United States, and you have them in Europe too, called community-supported agriculture. You know, you 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 uh, you can choose to buy your uh, produce directly from small farmers in your area, and I've been urging people to look at that. But these people think big. The 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 right and they know what they're doing and they have plans already in place. And when people who are progressive or trying to mobilize the people speak up and say things like in the United States, we want free healthcare for all, you're poo-pooed. You know, you're told, oh, that's not realistic. It's like none of these people read the history of, of Frederick Douglass, one of the great liberation leaders from this country who said, power concedes nothing without a demand. What the Democrats ask us or ask us to believe is that power concedes nothing unless the people concede everything beforehand. That's that's not how it works. So this society is going to be radically transformed for the worse unless people buy, bound themselves together and force those in power either out or to do the right thing. You know what's crazy is that Donald Trump and you know sometimes you know Trump just throws shit out there and hope that hopes that it sticks. But Trump the other day was sort of saying, "Huh, 30% of people may not have health insurance as a result of this. Maybe we should expand Medicare." What? I mean, you know, okay, I don't believe anything Trump says, but Trump did make accurate statements about the Iraq war. You know, he said on, on Fox News once, he said, you know, you think Putin's a killer? We kill a lot of people all the time throughout history. You know, sometimes Trump says the right thing for the wrong reason. But if you have Donald Trump floating an idea of expanding Medicare, just because he hates the term Obamacare, let's try to get that, to, you know, to happen. Let, let's, let's try. But no, we have Hillary Clinton tweeting the other day, Donald Trump should do the right thing and reopen the exchanges for people to buy health care. It's like in her palace, wherever she is right now, you know, where her husband is made and she make huge money speaking all over the place. She didn't think that, that, that now would be the time to say Medicare for all and instead to say, let's reopen the exchange so that people who lost their health care can go back in and buy expensive health care from for-profit companies. So we can radically change society if we wake up and understand that if we don't do it, the right wing is, all, is absolutely gonna do it and they're gonna win and history is filled with examples of when the people are silent, the worst people win. Luckily, we are connected, not only through this show, but also we are building up something what we call the Progressive International, uh, where Naomi Klein, whom you mentioned, Noam Chomsky, but many people from the global south, from Asia, Africa are already joining. And I would also be very happy to see you joining as well. Uh, uh, and I have a question from someone who is also part of the Progressive International, who is watching our show. Uh, he says, excellent show. And there is a question from him, namely Yanis Varoufakis for you. Uh, is this not the right time to support Amazon striking workers by organizing a one day of not even visiting the Amazon site internationally? What do you think about that proposal? Uh, I mean, I love it. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of us, uh, you know, who have used Amazon or, you know, I mean, I, I have an Amazon Prime subscription that I'm going to cancel. But why do I have an Amazon Prime subscription in the United States? Um, well, when you have children or, uh, you know, or you have an emergency, Amazon can get it to you the next day. And that's that's the kind of allure of it. Or, you know, I use it because I want to watch non-American, you know, documentary series or television shows, blah, blah, blah. You know, 
my use of Amazon is largely has largely been one of privilege. You know, oh, I want to get it faster, etc. And you know, I'm I'm aware of what Amazon is. I try in my life not to use it, but I have no problem admitting I too have used Amazon, like most people in the world, and certainly most people in this country. Um, but in this exact moment, there are poor people, pensioners, sick people. Their only way of getting anything is through Amazon or Walmart or huge corporations because small businesses can't compete and they're getting crushed. And we don't want elderly people going out. So, you know, I agree and, and, and would do it myself. I think we have to be really careful. It's, it, it also kind of kicks into the question about Biden versus Trump. We don't, we, we don't necessarily know what the reality is of the people who are in most danger. And, you know, I have a, I have a parent with an underlying respiratory condition who had to uh, had to have an emergency intervention because her she couldn't breathe recently uh, during this uh, this uh, pandemic, and um, you know she and and my dad are having to order you know order their food. They don't like Amazon. They follow this. They're good people. They're retired nurses. If we say to them, we're going to take this away from you right now, and we don't have a solution for them, um, then we're whistling past the graveyard. The, the problem is Amazon has become a monopoly. I believe it should be nationalized. I believe that not that Amazon shouldn't exist, it should be determined to be a utility and should be nationalized. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think also Zoom should be nationalized. Uh, Tesla should be nationalized. Google should be nationalized. I know this sounds like a crazy dream, uh, but to come back to the question, so you mentioned your parents and I'm sorry to hear about it. Uh, but what if they order all the, I'm being very concrete. Yeah. Uh, what if they or all the other people who depend on Amazon order all this stuff before having in mind that only for one day, only for one day we do an international strike? No, I, I, I agree. I agree uh, completely. And, you know, yeah, people can go back and look uh, on my Twitter feed from a couple of days ago. I was soliciting from people. Uh, around the country, and actually, some people from Europe also wrote in. Like, if you send me um, a a community supported agriculture project in your area that is delivering boxes of fresh produce for people on a subscription basis, I'll retweet them. So I, you know, I had hundreds of people writing in, and I was retweeting how people can do all of these things. Um, you know, my my point is not that it's not a good idea, or I don't support it. I completely support it. But I, I think we need to be very careful at this delicate moment when there are people who are at risk of not eating, you know, elderly people who live alone, et cetera, of making sure that we're not shaming pe the very people that we, uh, you know, that we claim to support. And I think that, you know, uh, what can grow out of crises like this is building alternative networks of small shops and farmers and producers that can present viable alternatives to the monopoly. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but it, it, you know, it, it, all of us should be shopping locally. None of us should be buying from Amazon if we can live and not do it. Um, the problem is Amazon has become like a growth that if you rip it off of some people, um, it's going to hurt them very badly. And I think that the, you know, big, big scale boycotts only work if enough people do them. And I agree, we should boycott Amazon to the extent that we can. Uh, doing a one-day stoppage of purchasing from Amazon would be fantastic if we recognize that there are people for whom Amazon is their only lifeline right now. Um, so it's recognizing the problem, and you know, and then diagnosing it and responding to it properly. You know, I, I don't mean to be in any way encouraging anyone to use Amazon. What I'm saying is. Uh, you know, sometimes, and this happens a lot on the left in the United States, people talk past workers, people talk past the poor. And, and I think that, you know, when you, when you know people who are the targeted community and you listen to them or you ask them, well, why do you continue to use Amazon? And you start to hear their answers. It teaches you something about how we've allowed, how we've allowed these companies to control so many aspects of our lives. But we should nationalize these companies. Yeah, and, I, yeah. I, I, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, that's heresy in the United States, but um, look, it, it's, it is what it is. When the richest man in the world can take time out of his day to smear a young black worker at one of his warehouses, when the richest man on earth can do that, we can, we can imagine a plan to try to nationalize his business.
Mm. Uh, well, you mentioned an important point, uh, which gives me actually hope, you know, that uh, after a crisis or at the moment of the crisis, you can also see, I hate the term resilience, because I think it's a very ideological term and we should just reject that term resilience, uh, because it is, it's a kind of return to the normal, you know, people will overcome it and so on, and we cannot return to the normal. But what you said is, buy local food, uh, 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 avoid big monopoly capitalism and so on. We in Europe, during the last crisis, uh, I remember very well because I visited Greece several times, I visited Spain several times, which were the countries, you know, the so-called pigs, which yeah. were hurt the most by the financial crisis and by the bailout of the rich, what is now happening on a much bigger scale. And what I found there is how people reacted. You know, they were, that was five, six years ago, they were doing precisely what you said. You know, in Greece, they were establishing alternative markets after the big potato crisis, then there was a potato movement. Uh, so the, the producers of potato, agriculture, avoided the supermarkets and also the middlemen. You know, there is always someone in the middle and so on. Yeah. And, start, and started to sell their products directly to the consumers. And so you create better bonds, you support directly the consumer, you even know the name of the cow from where the milk comes and so on. <laughs> I mean, I'm not romanticizing now, but it actually creates a much more sustainable model. Something similar was happening in Spain as well with the cooperatives. They even invented their own currencies. Uh, everything was functioning uh, and still is on a principle which is not based on money, but it actually exchange, you know. Uh, but my question is, and that was always my question, and I didn't see it happening yet. You know, yeah. many already uh, uh, local examples of cooperatives, local businesses, and so on. But the problem is all, always in face of monopoly capitalism. How do you scale it up? You know, how do you scale it up that this becomes a resistance movement, which will then, you know, pull away the Amazons, the Googles, and the Jeff Bezos of our current dystopian world? I mean, part, part of it requires understanding how this functions on a global scale. You know, you and I did uh, uh, what became a very popular segment on my show, Intercepted, where we were talking about the non-align movement, um, you know, which was started in the 1950s. And, you know, we talked a lot about, uh, about uh, Josip Broz Tito of Yugoslavia and his role in it. Um, but if you just look, for, for instance, right now at what Cuba and China, how they've responded to other countries, Cuba, which is a, an island of 11 million people that has been under a, a ferocious US economic blockade uh, for almost its entire history post-revolution in 1959, 1960, they are exporting doctors and have for decades around the world, and in this particular case, to the front lines of coronavirus. In the US political election, Bernie one of the reasons that Bernie Sanders got destroyed uh, and Joe, when Joe Biden started to ascend, is red baiting. And Bernie Sanders' crime was uh, that he had not denounced Cuba's literacy program. It's not about, Bernie Sanders has gotten criticized from the left for being too harsh in his condemnations of the Cuban government and Fidel Castro. But what he was destroyed for was having the audacity to state the truth as though it were true, which is that Cuba has an exemplary education uh, program and as a health system that thrives despite the fact that the United States has tried to kill people there with its economic policy. I bring Cuba up because one of Cuba's real crimes at the beginning of the revolutionary period in Cuba was aiming to try to achieve self-sufficiency through the exporting of sugarcane, which was you know a, a viable cash crop for, for Cuba. And the United States punished them for trying to do it. Anytime you see governments rising up and trying to shift from cash crop economy to sustainable agriculture, huge corporations, the Monsantos, the Archo Daniels Midland, powerful co uh, countries in Europe, the United States, all come in and try to break it up. Why? They say, well, this is an unfair competition. You know, the, the free market is their Bible, you know, they, and, and, and by the way, we should not even call it the free market. It's the unfair market. It's the corporate market. So, it's not just about us organizing locally in our communities. We need to be thinking of what does a world without, you know, we're always gonna have borders in, in one sense, but what does it mean to break the shackles of borders in your mind and view your life as linked to a rural farmer in France's life, is linked to a factory worker in China's life who's making 
uh, the phone that, that you're then using to post your, you know, TikTok video or your, your Instagram video. And, and right now, all of the corporate politicians in Europe and the United States have a monopoly on capturing, uh, on, on limiting the scope of debate. In the United States, it comes in the form of, yeah, I agree, we should have healthcare for all, but let's lobby to get this change or that change. History has been uh, written by people who dare to think outside of the parameters defined by those in power and the rich. And I feel like with the, uh, with the ascent of the internet era, corporate power has been more effective in limiting debate than we have been in breaking the shackles uh, and the parameters that they they try to set for us. So, you know, I think I believe in the cliche adage that you know you you think globally and act locally, um, but we also need to act globally. And and we have uh, a two edged sword with the internet. It can be a power for evil. It can be a power for good. And I think that you know what you guys are trying to do with DM twenty five. You know what I what I think many of the people who supported Bernie Sanders campaign are trying to do is to say, we, we are one, it's not me, it's us. I think that was a brilliant way of framing how so many of us have felt for a long time. But let's be clear, we are up against violent, powerful individuals who will kill you if you get in the way of their profits. And that's the message being sent clearly in this country right now as this pandemic plagues, uh, particularly the city I'm in right now, New York, and it's gonna be the poorest people who are gonna be killed but we absolutely owe it to the workers at these big companies, Amazon, Whole Foods, Walmart. I'm sure you have a million of them too that you could name. When they go on strike, we don't cross picket lines. We don't- Yeah, we I, think, I, think, yeah I think our, our idea would be that when any one of them goes on strike, like in Amazon, when a worker, workers in Amazon go on strike, we go on strike. I think that should be our, our tactic. This week it's happening in Chicago too, which is another city with huge racial disparities and segregation. Amazon workers there are going to be uh, going to be walking off, you know. And so let us they... know. Let us know in Europe when we will organize. But you mentioned you. Men I'm serious. Uh, you mentioned Cuba. Uh, I mean, that was a beautiful gesture of solidarity on the one hand when the Cuban doctors arrived to Italy, which was, uh, you know, that was the worst place. Now it's not anymore. I mean, it still is, but now you have Spain, you have UK, and so on. And I remember uh, you also mentioned the Cuban Revolution. So let, let me reveal you a, a, a small detail, a personal one, but which includes a person uh, who is in direct touch, to put it like that, with the Cuban Revolution. Uh, a few years ago, I think it was eight or seven years ago, um, a guest of mine at the Subversive Festival in Zagreb was uh, Alida Guevara, uh, the daughter of Che Guevara. Uh, who is, by the way, a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. And you know, when she was in Croatia, she was asking us whether we can help her to find some medicine so she can bring the medicine back to Cuba. Why? Because of the US sanctions. So what you can also see with the coronavirus crisis is that, you know, instead of helping the people or helping the Cuban doctors to help us, what they yeah. are doing is they are the United States the, of, of Donald Trump imposing sanctions on Iran, imposing continuing sanctions on Cuba. So it, actually what they do doesn't have to do anything with, with the brain because you know, but, helping them, they could help us, you know? This one, one other, I, abs ab absolutely. Um, and one thing that I find just incredible is that the fascist Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil who expelled all the Cuban doctors has been begging for Cuba to send them back because his his government is completely incapable, like Trump is, of, of handling this situation. But you bring up Iran. In the United States, there is the most vicious propaganda um, against Iran that is just uh, uh, conventional wisdom among both Democrats and Republicans. Iran is evil, Iran is evil, Cuba is evil, Cuba is evil. Iran has released more than 100,000 prisoners since the outbreak of the coronavirus. In New York City, where I am right now, there are now more than 200 cases of coronavirus at Rikers Island alone. There are dozens of correctional officers, as they're called, the prison guards, who are infected. The state of New York, which is controlled by Democrats, just passed one of the most racist budget bills in recent history that is going to cut certain people's health care is going to make it easier to put people in prison at a moment when we are having outbreaks in our prisons. We look at other countries and say, the evil Iranian regime 
Iran did the right thing. They started releasing prisoners. We are still fighting tooth and nail against the democratic leaders of this city, Mayor Bill de Blasio, and this state, Andrew Cuomo, who a lot of Democrats say, oh, wouldn't he be a good guy to take on Trump, when they are waging war against the most vulnerable people in this city, people who are locked in cages. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for mentioning this, because it brings us to, to, to a person who didn't do any crime, but the person revealed actually the crimes, not only of United States, but of Russia, of Assad, of many others, of companies such as Google, Eric Schmidt, who was supporting Hillary Clinton and so on. And that person is Julian Assange, who is currently in the UK. Did you see what happened today? Today, the UK government said that they would release 4,000 prisoners uh, yeah. because of a big fear that they might be infected by the coronavirus. And the coronavirus is already spreading through the UK prisons, but they are not wanting to release Julian Assange and to put him in house arrest, you know. And since of 2002, he has a chronic lung, lung condition, you know. And this is a person who not only revealed the crimes of the United States, this is a person I was recently checking the WikiLeaks page. You know, it's fascinating what you can find about Ebola, SARS, swine yeah. flu, avian flu released by WikiLeaks, you know. If we had such a person today in China, in the United States, like Julian Assange, you know, we would be in a better situation. But and what the governments are doing, they're actually leaving him to die in, in, in a cage. Let, let, let me just start by saying, I, uh, I believe that Julian Assange should have never been placed in prison. Uh, the charges against him uh, in the United States uh, represent some of the most far-reaching and dangerous legal assertions ever made on the question of press freedom. Whatever anyone thinks about Julian Assange, uh, one thing is absolutely clear. Julian Assange provided a public service to the citizens of the United States and the world in helping to create WikiLeaks and by publishing documents that uh, demonstrated in clear, raw form the crimes that the United States government commits around the world on a daily basis, as well as other countries. The only reason that Julian Assange is in prison right now is because the United States wants him dead. The United States wants Julian Assange dead. And that is why he's in prison. People can debate whatever they want and ask questions about Julian Assange. I've interviewed Julian, I have my own questions. But let's be clear on what is happening here. None of the questions you have about Julian Assange, none of the criticisms people can level at Julian Assange justify the horrid human rights abusing treatment that he continues to receive. And if he dies, the blood of the United States government, the blood of Julian Assange is on the hands of the United States government. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. I think the same could be said also of Boris Johnson, who already has blood on his hands. And if Julian Assange dies, it's not only Boris Johnson who will have blood on his hands, it's also the journalists in Europe and other governments who didn't protect him. Uh, but unfortunately, we are- Can I ask you one question quickly? Please. Really quick. So since you and, and Zizek are, are good friends, I have one question for you. How does Zizek manage to not touch his face during COVID-19? <laughs> well, it's a good question because I realized that will surprise you. It's not only Zizek. When I rewatch some of these shows of DMTV, you will also watch it yourself. I know, I, I, but I wash my hands and I'm in my house right now alone. He's as well. He's as well, luckily. But <laughs> well, I'm just wouldn't... saying, like when he when he's out, you know, he's so animated and and such a part of it is is the time. Yeah. How on earth can that guy not touch his face? A million it's bazillion. Possible, but I must say something. On the one hand, I think we all touch our faces. Now yeah. I realize how much we touch our faces. But on the other side, because I spoke to him recently, the situation is very bad in Slovenia as well. You know, it's going the Hungarian way. It's, a, it's an autocratic dictatorship which is being born in Slovenia. Slavoj is 71, heart condition, diabetes. And if he ends up in the hospital, you know, probably there won't be enough ventilators. Yeah. So it's a very dire situation also for people like Slavoj. Mm -hmm. uh, we are Thank coming you so to much for what you're doing, Srečko, and, uh, and Love and solidarity to everybody at DM25 and all of our brothers and sisters throughout Europe and the world who are watching this. Everybody hang in there, we have each other. Thank you, Jeremy. I think what you are doing with The Intercept and what you are doing the progressive in the, in the United States, it's very inspiring for us in Europe. So we should get together much, much closer than we are now. I, agree, uh, but... I can see Astra Taylor is joining us for the next show. David Adler is not here, but maybe we can just say, uh, 
Hello to Astra, since you are still here. I guess you know her. And David Adler rejoined as well. Astra the next episode. A true it's hero. A nice episode tonight. All right, I'm 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 out of here. But um, David Astra, thank you guys for the work that you're doing. And uh, it's Jeremy Scahill, and I will see you all next time. Thanks a lot, Jeremy, for joining us today. And we talk later.